Uh, I don't think this is four credits, number one. This is a three-credit course, right? It's four credits? We meet two hours a week. It's a four-credit course? That's weird. Normally, it was a three-credit course that met for four hours. That's what we used to do in the old days, but I guess because we're a little bit more squeezed for time and space, uh, that's the way it's going to work. Okay, good. That means extra homework. All right, good. Uh, there's a few references here to materials that we'd like you to use. One of them is a reference to a textbook. The textbook, I'll go on the blackboard here. If you look on the course materials, you'll see the reference to the textbook. Fundamentals of Industrial Hygiene. I can't blow that up very easily. It's a really thick book. I don't have a copy with me now. It's about weighs about 10 pounds. It's a ridiculously large book. It's expensive. Uh, the sixth current edition is the sixth edition. Uh, it's a pretty good survey, pretty broad survey of industrial hygiene practice. Um, how many of you guys at one point, uh, since two people are, pub, uh, are public health majors, the rest of you are probably MS majors, right? Okay, and environmental and occupational health science. So there's a good chance that some of you guys may want to get certified at some point as certified safety professionals, as industrial hygienists, and so on and so forth. This book will be really valuable to you then okay so i would recommend you buy the book you know get a copy of the book the sixth edition uh costs about 200 bucks new two and a quarter new uh, it's available through the bookstore you can also get it through amazon um uh, uh there are earlier editions that, that you can get cheaper like the fifth edition is available and you can probably get that for under uh, easily under 100 bucks if you shop around a little bit so if you're an MPH major and you don't think you're ever going to be, you know, working as an industrial hygienist, then you need to save a few bucks. You can get away with the fifth edition. But you guys that are MS majors should really buy at the uh, uh, really only use might benefit from it. But if you don't have the money for it and you're not an, 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 an MS major, I could understand, you know, trying to save a few bucks on the book. But I, we really need to use that because you, you, it's going to wind up being on your bookshelf you know, forever at this point, because you're going to be referring to it in the future. Um, the other thing that we're going to reference here as uh, uh, material we're going to be working with is material on the CDC website, and uh, that's basically OSHA and NIOSH, that uh, references uh, analytical techniques. Uh, how many of you guys have been on the uh, CDC website to look up, like, NIOSH procedures, like how to do a procedure for formaldehyde or for so on and so forth? Okay, good. All right. So you're, you're headed in most of the MS majors already. Okay, so, so um, uh, the, we have some links and some references to, to procedures and manuals that are published online by, by CDC, by OSHA, uh, on how to do various kinds of analytical techniques. And some of the links are down here. There's also some other recommended readings. I wouldn't worry about them for our purposes. I'll be posting a lot of reference material myself that you use. I'll try and kind of like segregate the material that I post because I'll be posting manuals, videos, instructional videos, all kinds of stuff that I've accumulated over the last X number of years. I'll be posting those, but I'll try and segregate it into material that's likely to, you know, if there's an exam or something like that, then we might be drawing material from that. Or if you really need it for that particular week or for that particular lab report, that the material is in one area, so you don't have to go through all the other stuff and figure out what's important and what's not important. So if you notice that I'm getting you know, over the top with the amount of material that I post and you don't know what you should be concentrating on, let me know and I'll make sure it's a little bit clearer. I'm going over the checklist of things in my head that like pros and cons you know, on the evaluation sheets. So, so from the previous version of this course. Okay, so, so hi. 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 Take a seat. So we're just going over the syllabus right now. And I was just telling them, are you an MS major or a public, are you a public health major? Yes. Okay. Okay. The textbook's very expensive. The sixth edition, I'll, I'll wait to come back and let you know. Okay. So at any rate, um, 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 this gives you a basic idea of like the skills you're going to be using in this course, the learning in this course and the material, kind of material and the concentrations on this course, what we're trying to accomplish in the course. Um, uh, uh, grading is going to be based on uh, uh, these parameters. Number one is a critical appraisal. That's an invention of Brian's. I believe he typically would post 
a, uh, a study or some piece of literature and ask you to critically give you some guidelines, ask you to critically appraise it. I don't have the materials that he was using. I'm going to talk to him about it. I'm going to push that off to next week. Okay, so if you see that it's due this week, don't it's it's signed this week and due next week. Don't worry about it. I'm going to move that to second and third week uh, instead. So it's going to be basically get a get you guys get you guys kind of like pointed in the direction of how an industrial hygienist would approach an environmental problem. Okay, uh, memos. Then then we have memos and industrial hygiene reports. So a total of five reports basically. The memo reports are basically going to be scaled down version of a, um, a, a full lab report. A full lab report's gonna have, you're gonna be describing methodology, you're gonna be describing what you did, collection of data, presenting your data, uh, doing some analysis, um, uh, giving us some conclusion. I'll give you a format for the lab reports as they come up. You'll have three of those to do. Those are gonna be made, your major submissions. The memos, which you described here as memo reports, are going to be scaled down versions of that. They're going to be probably typically going to be procedures that I've written out for you to do some lab work, work with some equipment, take some measurements, and so on and so forth. And then you, there'll be there'll be uh, areas for you to collect data, and then probably a series of questions based on that data that you can answer. Some most some of them may be just simple calculations. Some of them may be kind of essay type questions and so on. So there'll be scaled down versions of those lab reports. Uh, participation show up every week you know, uh, uh, take part in the class and so on and so forth. And uh, and that's your participation grade. Uh, there will be an exam. It's only going to be 10% of the grade because it is a lab course. But uh, uh, I think at the end of the semester, it might be good to at least uh, uh, sit down critically and evaluate for ourselves how much of the material we like really got absorbed. I might actually do that earlier in the semester, like maybe the middle of the semester, so that I can get, get an idea of how much you guys have gotten that you absorbed in the material at that point and what the problem areas are so I can make adjustments uh, uh, as we move on. Kind of like, you know, the, these courses are kind of like the Titanic. You know, it's kind of hard to turn when you see the iceberg. It takes a little while to adjust. And finally, a class project. We have a lot of latitude there. We can discuss that before we get to that point. It's going to be the end of the semester. That can either be an entire group project. For instance, when Jack Caravanos was here one semester, he had the entire class surveying, surveying um, uh, ambient lead levels and dust in New York City. And the way that they did it, each person collected a bunch of wipes. And the way that they did it, they would pick out a bus line. And as the bus line would cross Queens or the Bronx or Brooklyn or something like that, they would run out when the bus made the stop, take a quick wipe on, the, on those glass it's, uh, enclosures that have outside the bus, get back on the bus, pay, do it again on the next stop, and the next stop, and the next stop. The bus driver probably thought you insane, but I mean, basically you could explain it to him, but that's what Jack did. So he collected all that data, they got the wipes analyzed, and uh, they had a pretty good survey of what areas and what levels what levels of airborne lead would likely to be because in, in the air in various areas of the city, because that, you know, that, that dust settles out onto these bus enclosures and they don't always clean them that often. So it gives you an opportunity to you know figure that stuff out. So we can either do a class project, something like that, maybe noise measurements somewhere uh, uh, in various environments or some other stuff, or we can break up into groups or we can do even individual projects. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off on uh, uh, deciding exactly what that is until I can get some feedback from you guys. So figure about by, by week four or five, we should have a pretty good idea of how we're gonna handle that class project. Okay, good. Okay, that's a grading system that they use here throughout Hunter. And have various other normal stuff you see in, in the syllabus. If you have any accessibility uh, issues, you can let me know about it or let your advisor know about it to communicate to me. Um, give some of the expectations for you and me. Typically, uh, best way to reach me is by email. Um, I typically respond to emails within a day or two. I like to use really, uh, uh, I really like to use the discussion boards to a, a, a large degree because if someone has a question about a lab or something like that or about calculation, if it's posted to the discussion boards, when I answer it, then everyone else benefits from that answer as well. Okay, so, um, uh, and also it's a little bit fairer because if I give somebody a little bit of help on a lab, 
that, that other people can go there and look at it and get that same aid in uh, putting together a lab. If I give them a, if I give a clarification or so on, so everybody has access to it. How many of you guys have used the discussion boards on Blackboard before? Okay. How many guys are new to Blackboard haven't used it before? Nobody. Okay, so at least we have, at least at least uh, everybody's familiar with Blackboard. At least somewhat familiar with Blackboard. Okay. Uh, the only thing, other thing I got to change here is, I believe that February 25th is spring break, right? And I'm not sure. I think we we're scheduled for 15 classes. There must be a something is Thursday or something like that. But I'm gonna have to go back through the dates and figure out. I have the fourth of what? Oh, spring break. Oh, there you go. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, everything. Those will get pushed back to the fourth. And I guess then uh, everything else will be fill in there. And the twenty, uh, the twenty, what the class that would be normally be the twenty fifth. That is a Thursday, right? Is that a Thursday, the twenty fifth? Yeah, anybody got a calendar on? Them? Are those dates right? Okay, yeah, so those are, those dates are right. So yes, yeah, so I'll just push that back and it'll be filled in. If you, uh, I'll post a new version of the syllabus tonight. So if you want to download it, you'll be able to get to it. Okay, any questions so far on that the syllabus on Blackboard? Any questions? Any objections? Any? Uh, so when you push the date, the time is uh, Yeah, it'll go with it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's pretty late for spring break, right? Okay, good. Let me get this out of the way. Now, personally, I hate PowerPoints, but this first week, I think we're kind of stuck doing that because we really kind of introduced this material. Went down. Did it, did it, is it still on the screen? Yes, no, oh, okay, good. Okay. You guys have something to work with here, like maybe a piece of paper and a uh, pencil or your calculator or something like that. Because I want to play around with a few odds and ends here. Okay. So typically, this course is going to consist of uh, lectures and lab sessions. I'm going to try and avoid having just except for this first session which is going to be largely lecture with a little bit of like you know playing around with some stuff um i'm going to try and avoid having you know sessions that are just lecture sections because we're here to like learn what industrial hygiene practice really is get some hands-on with instruments and so on and so forth and and figure out how how this stuff really works and I, the lectures can get pretty boring over a period of time especially two hours of lectures particularly syllabus we talked about syllabus course requirements um uh we're going to talk tonight a little bit about some background on uh, industrial hygiene practice uh, uh what goes on in labs uh, 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 how we evaluate hazardous environments uh, uh regulations osha various various other kinds of uh, um, organizations um, and we're going to talk a little bit about preparing reports and how reports should be formatted. Okay, so again, lab and it's typically going to be either lecture and lab or an entire session that's going to be a lab where we prepped for it the uh, week before. Um, we're, uh, beginning of the session, we're already going to cover a little, maybe five or ten minutes on safety because that's part of our training, right? What well, part of what industrial hygienists are going to do are going to be pe uh, training people and in, in, uh, uh, safe and maintaining a safe workplace. So we might as well get into the habit of doing that ourselves as well. Um, some of this stuff will be hands-on. Um, we don't always have enough equipment for everybody to do everything together. So when we do hands-on stuff, very frequently it'll be in small groups, two or three people working together with the equipment. Uh, there'll be an occasional demonstrations because we only have a single piece of equipment. Um, uh, but I'll try and get as much participation involved in that as well. Be a lot of data collection. We're going to be uh, doing measurements and so on and so forth. Uh, and we're going to be at, don't, don't worry about the percentages there. They're not, they're not 
corrected from the syllabus. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so industrial hygienists work in all kinds of environments. They work in schools. There's a hygienist that works for CUNY as a safety officer. There's, there's uh, 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 hospitals have uh, employee industrial hygienists uh, that specialize in uh, 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 areas of uh, uh, where uh, medical personnel might be exposed to particular hazards. Uh, you have guys that are there. These guys are working out in the oil fields in Iraq. You know, the Army uh, has hygienists. Um, the uh, the uh, 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 unions, many of the unions employ industrial hygienists. Um, anybody here employed currently as an industrial hygienist? What do you do? Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, we talked. I would talk. Let them know kind of like what kind of thing, thing you do on a day to day basis. Yeah. Um, so right now, mostly you do air quality. Occasionally, asbestos. Um, we just got to the like, you know, Okay. But yeah, a lot of schools, um, we have contracts with USDA. Um, and then. Do any work with HUD? Um, or with NYCHA? No, but they have a, they have a huge contract that's been out for the um, it's, it's being proposed, right? In other words, you have to bid on it, or has it already been uh, awarded? Oh yeah, because that's we just heard the announcement today that they're going to have a monitor, and one of the first things that they're going to approach is redoing all the clearances for lead because that issues yeah. where you know, supposedly all these apartments had been tested for lead, they were cleared, and then they had kids showing up in school with uh, high lead levels. And oh no, oh yeah, really? Okay. Okay, so th there's all sorts of environments you're going to wind up working. Could be in schools, could be in housing projects, could be uh, in hospitals, and so on and so forth. There, there's practically no place, no, no, nothing environmentally that you might see in the cover uh, of the post uh, uh, causing hysteria that an industrial hygienist is not buried back there in somewhere, uh, back there in somewhere uh, doing measurements and so on. Yes. So the, the reason why you guys are uh, maybe is because the buildings were doing steel and steel. No, no, no. What happens is lead paint. Lead? Yeah. The, 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 there's two. There's two primary sources of lead. Um, uh, 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 main, mo most of the exposure you're concerned about is in children and pregnant women, right? So, so the two main places where you have in, in lead in the environment, in New York, uh, particularly in housing, is in paint. Lead paint was very expensive paint. They used it up until the 70s. They started to restrict the use of lead paint, lead-based paint. Uh, in the 70s, lead-based paint had lead oxide in it. Lead oxide is a very good pigment. It's very durable. Lead-based paint was very expensive. Uh, it typically was used on exterior surfaces, right? But it had a lot of lead in it. The paint, over time, starts to chalk, flake off, and so on and so forth. And that dust gets into the environment and if people have used that lead inappropriately indoors, then it gets in the environment where children may be walking, you know, like crawling around on the floor, pick up the lead in their dust, and, you know, kids have their fingers in their mouths all the time, so they're, they, they're going to wind up ingesting a lot of lead. In New York City, uh, virtually all children are screened for lead when they start school, when they're about five years old or so. And if, they, if the, uh, their uh, blood lead levels are elevated, the, the action level right now is, is five micrograms per deciliter of blood. If it's above that level, then someone investigates why is that kid being exposed to lead. The first thing they may do is send someone out from the Department of Health to investigate their, where they live, whether or not there's lead paint present, whether it's flaking, whether, it's, uh, uh, whether they have a problem with it. There also is a local law that requires that if you own a, um, a, a multiple family building, that when you have a, a new lease or a changeover in a tenant, if they have children under a certain age, you have to hire someone like him to come in and do a screening for lead. That's basically he inspects the paint to see if it's in good condition, and he also does wipes on the floor, the windowsills, and what the door jams or something like that. Uh, yeah, no, I haven't done it. Uh, okay. Training. Yeah, the specific the specific procedure. Well, yeah, the sills floors. Sills, window sills, and floors. Any, any friction surface. Yeah, like door jams or something like that. Because, you know, any place where you got rubbing a paint, you know, you're going to get some dust. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh yeah, but they still and the actual whatever that's called the bay is it right? Yeah, this is the space but where the window slides down there too. So they they take they take wipes. They send them out to a lab. If the level is is higher than a certain uh, uh, a permissible level, then the the landlord has to do something to either abate it or to control it, right? So uh, and then it gets retested again. So lead paint is the primary culprit in lead poisoning in children in New York City. There's also an issue with water, because in New York City we also have a lot of piping that is um, an old copper piping that's soldered with lead tin solder. And the water supply that we have is very corrosive. It corrodes the copper and the lead. And if you don't use the water for a while, that lead and copper builds up in the water. And when you're the first person to drink it, you're getting a dose of lead each time. Kids tend to drink a lot of water, so and their you know body mass is small. So that contributes to the lead load for the children as well. It used to be that that we can that most people were not that concerned about lead in drinking water, because in New York City. Uh, most serve, uh, there were a couple of studies that suggested that uh, when a kid was exposed to lead, only about 10 or 15 percent of ex his exposure came from water. Most of the exposure was from the paint. But now we we went from the the action level being uh, 25 micrograms per deciliter to 15 to 10, and out of five, so now all of a sudden that's something that's a small exposure can be significant because the action level is so low as well. And there's a lot of concern about it in schools and so on and so forth, because schools have, um, most of the schools in New York City have pretty old infrastructure as well. So it's piping, it's the piping, and it's the paint that they're most concerned about, right? I think I read a study that said that to abate all of the lead paint in residences in the United States would cost something like $5 trillion or something like that over the course of like 10 or 20 years. So it's not a pro it's not something that's gonna happen overnight. And it's not something that usually is cured by removing the paint. It's usually cured by, by uh, maintaining the painted surfaces so you don't get a lot of flaking and dusting. So anyway, yeah. So there's, there's a typical area where an industrial hygienist might work in doing that kind of monitoring and testing. And NYCHA now, today, one of the first things they're going to approach is going out and testing all these buildings for lead, retesting all these buildings for lead because they're concerned that the initial tests weren't thorough enough. Yeah. In this sense, industrial hygienists like the war zone areas like have to like. Bomb. Of course, sure. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure the, in fact, the Army has guys that are, you know, that are trained as hygienists, right? Army Corps of Engineers, I'm sure, employs hygienists, you know. And in fact, there was a fellow in this, in this, that was taking courses here that was, uh, 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 was in the Army, and they gave him a year and a half to complete the program here. So I, I don't know, I think I you finished the program. That's, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a asthma inspector oh, for the Air Force. Oh, OK, there you go. We do a lot of bombing, so I go out every time. Whenever there's a bomb that we do like a practicing, right. like a testing, wearing the mask, and uh, wearing a uh, tape, right. identifying what kind of nuclear yeah. based on that. And we also have two needles in our pocket. Because we're infected, we have to inject it into our heart. OK. So it's lethal. <laughs> Can you say? It's very lethal. I'm saying that okay for the army part of it, it's it's not as that's why I'm trying to understand how it is in the in the in, in civilian, civilian world. world. Okay, my world is different. You yeah, get exposed. Well, you you're you're, you're <laughs> actually to be honest with you, there uh, people that are work in hazardous waste sites are often exposed to environments that can be just as lethal, right? So there's we're going to talk about uh, anybody here take the Hazwapper course, 40 hour Hazwapper course. Right, so there's special training for people that are, you know, that work at hazardous waste sites because typically hazardous waste site, you go into an environment that's unknown. It could be any kind of material that could be old, stored old, dangerous chemicals, could be explosive materials, could be flammable materials, you know. So, so they're also in a, that's that has whopper training is probably very similar to the kind of training that you took in the army, you know. So, we'll talk about that, we'll talk about that a bit as well. So here we go, here's various environments, microbiological, there's our paint there. I don't remember why I put that picture there. Has, I think the name of the group has something to do with it. Anybody know who they are? Anthrax, Anthrax that's what it is. I knew it. <laughs> I couldn't remember why I put that picture there. And that's Anthrax, that's about right above there too, you know. So at any rate, yeah, so there's a hazardous environment. In fact, a lot of it that when, when we're having those the, that issue in um, in uh, 2012, 2020 uh, was it 2010, 2011, 
when uh, all these uh, packets of like uh, anthrax powder with uh, you know the weaponized yeah. anthrax showing up around the United States, industrial hygienists were doing the cleanup and the and the monitoring at the post office here where they had uh, an issue. Um, uh, I know a couple of companies that were involved in that here. Okay, so yeah, we get involved in all kinds of all kinds of stuff. Okay, so. Our, in order to evaluate an environment, we got to measure the environment. We have to understand the environment. We have to understand what the hazards are. We have to evaluate it. And then we have to understand what we need to measure and how to measure it. Okay, so, and we need standards, right? In other words, it, it doesn't do any good to measure something than if you don't have a standard to compare it to, whether it's, see whether it's safe, dangerous, if there's other issues with it, and so on and so forth. That's why I love mold, because mold, you do a lot of measuring and there's no standard, so it's all useless anyway. Right? So, but people insist on testing for mold. Right? Now, when you do mold inspections, right? Do you do uh, mold spore counts or wipes or anything like that? Or uh, yeah. Do you have customers that demand it even though you tell them not to bother, right? No, exactly. Not, that's most yeah, uh, most, most more real mold inspection is on visual. As you look for mold, it's not like it's invisible. You can see it, you can smell it. So typically, and, and you usually know where to look for it because you're looking for condensation or moisture and so on and so forth. So usually you don't really need to do any testing, right? But a lot of customers insist they want testing, but there's no standard for what's an acceptable level of mold in an environment. So uh, uh, the testing is kind of fruitless anyway, but a lot of times you wind up doing it anyway. Okay, so we want standards. Who, who publishes these standards? Well, OSHA publishes standards for workplaces, permissible exposure limits, short-term exposure limits, uh, ceilings, uh, uh, recommended exposure limits. How many of you guys are, are familiar with all of these terms? I want to get a handle on like where we are with all this stuff. Okay, good. And ACGIH, American Con Congress of Government and Industrial Hygienists. Who can tell me what the difference between a PEL and a TLB is? Don't. Yeah, TLB is not it's not established by the government, right? It's a consensus standard by a committee. It's an organization of what just what it says, industrial hygienists that work for the government and in industry, and they they consider they're usually people that have some experience with the with this particular hazard or material, and they come to a consensus at what they think is a safe level for exposure, what the maximum level for safe exposure is. And that's based, it's called threshold level because it's based on something called the threshold effect. Most toxic materials, how many guys, how many people here have ever drunk a beer? A lot of people here, right? So alcohol is a toxin, right? It's poison, basically alcohol. If you drink enough alcohol, you're gonna die, right? That happens all the time in fraternities every once in a while, right? So you drink enough alcohol, you're gonna die, it's poison. However, if you go home and have a glass of wine or two every night after work, and some doctors will tell you, some studies would suggest that that's actually good for you, even though the alcohol is toxic to your liver and kidneys, right? So why is that? What happens there? What's happening is your body can tolerate that level of that material, of that substance, that level of exposure without showing any health effects, right? At some point, if you drink enough alcohol, you start to see some health effects, right? So that level at which it starts to, you get that inflection where it starts to show some health effects is called the threshold level, okay, where, where you're concerned now it's gonna affect your health. The TLVs presumably are supposed to be the level at which, the maximum level at which you will not see any health effects. Above that, you're, you're on your own, you might start to see health effects. That's the objective there. Well, the TLB is usually more stringent than the PELs. Yeah, because they're based on like health effects, right? The PELs are like kind of a uh, uh, a, uh, a combination of uh, uh, what what OSHA or NIOSH, which is the research branch of OSHA, what NIOSH squeezes is a uh, is a safe level, and what industrially they think they can achieve. In other words, for instance, um, uh, if an industry is using a certain hazardous material, they have no substitute for it, you know, um, OSHA, OSHA may say, well, you know, we really don't want you to be exposed to more than 20 ppm of this material. However, in industry, they say, well, that's not achievable. You know, we can't, can't do that at this stage with this technology and so on and so forth. So the PEL might not reflect what NIOSH sees as the best science for in terms of health effects. 
So the PELs are not always protective. PEL for car PEL for and the PELs are published in the uh, 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 in the uh, uh, help me with this. They're published in the uh, excuse me. What's that? No, they're yeah. The tablets are paper, but pay, that table is published in uh, uh, the uh, no. This what is it? Nineteen ten. Uh, yeah, general industry of the. Help me out here. The congestional record. Yeah, but it's a congestional record. But there's another name. But CFRs, Code of Federal Regulation. There's a series of manuals that that uh, I'm uh, senior moment. There's a series of manuals called the Code of Federal Regulations. All of these industrial uh, regulations involving labor and the environment, they're published in these manuals, in these uh, 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 volumes. Okay, uh, uh, labor is uh, uh, 1910, the environment is 40, and so on and so forth. So, so uh, the, uh, the president, all the, uh, all the, all the uh, regulations regarding the uh, office of the president, I think is Title III. It's published in Volume Three. If you want to look up any specific uh, 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 information about uh, what courts and what the uh, 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 Congress has uh, uh, ruled on regarding the uh, uh, office of president, you can look it up in that in the Code of Federal Regulations. They're online. You can actually read them. In fact, all, as we move through this material, when we look at a regulation, when we look at a standard, I might give you the reference to the Code of Federal Regulations, and I might describe to you what it says. But you can go to the Code of Regulations online and actually look it up and get the uh, uh, information straight from the horse's mouth, as they would say. Okay, so the PEL is not necessarily protective. The TLVs usually are lower because they're intended to be protective, and they don't have to be published or approved by Congress to wind up in the Code of Federal Regulations. Technically, the PEL for carbon monoxide exposure for workers, for any you know, time weighted average for workers, is 50 ppm. Almost everybody uses 35, right? Because the TLV is 35, and OSHA has not been able to get an amendment to change the TL, uh, the PEL for carbon monoxide to 35 parts per million for you know for various reasons. Okay, so there's there's differences between those two. Short-term exposure limit usually refers to a 15-minute exposure, and the ceiling is the maximum that you can be exposed to at all. The EPA has standards. Okay, the EPA uh, has standards uh, for air, amb national ambient air quality standard, describes uh, what levels of different kinds of contaminants that you can have in the air before the EPA will start to, uh, 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 start, to start litigation against the municipality or state or something like that. Uh, New York City is frequently out of compliance with the national ambient air quality standard for carbon monoxide and for hydrocarbon particulates. And that's one of the reasons that occasionally you'll hear a lot of uh, discussion about restricting uh, vehicular traffic in Manhattan um, uh, and also about uh, uh, regulations regarding idling of vehicles uh, in Manhattan because the airborne levels of a lot of these contaminants, uh, when they start to approach those levels, the, um, uh, uh, the EPA will start to crack down on these various municipalities. And for instance, in New York City, um, if you idle a vehicle, if you park and idle a vehicle for more than three minutes, you can get a $300 fine. They only enforce that when the EPA is cracking down on them, right? So when the EPA cracks down on them and there's an issue about uh, air quality, yes. So a day like today is where it's 10 degrees too warm if they cross the grid middle of Yes, exactly, yep. Exactly. But they don't. That's one again. They enforce that, you know, selectively uh, when there's an issue with the EPA over the ambient air quality standard. The EPA also publishes the Safe Drinking Water Act, which which uh, uh, determines how many samples a municipality has to take of its water to test it. If it's a, if they have if they're supplying a hundred homes, they may only have to test the water once a month or twice a month. If they're supplying eight hundred thousand service points, like in New York City. They may have to test 25 samples a day. Throughout the city, you'll see these test stations. Uh, have you guys, do you guys, have you seen these test stations? You know what they are? I'll show you a picture of them later on. They have test stations, these little stands with a little silver box with a lock on it. They can open up and they can run water out of it, take a sample. 
they're all over the city. So they go out, they have guys that work for the Department of Health that go out, or the, actually the um, New, York State, New York City DEP. They go out, they take samples, they go to a lab, they analyze it for all these different priority pollutants that are in the Safe Drinking Water Act to make sure that New York City's water meets the, uh, the uh, uh, EPA standards, Safe Drinking Water Act standards. Uh, there's one of them though that's a problem. What did I just tell you about lead? Where does lead come from in water? Piping. piping, but the piping where? In the buildings, right? It's the piping in the building, right? So if they're, if they're taking a sample on the street off of these sample points, how do they know what it is in the building where, you know, after it goes through the piping in the building and it's picked up lead? So they don't have lead pipe to the main? Uh, they have, the, the, the street mains are all steel now. You won't find some lead. You'll find, sometimes you'll find from the steel main in the street, you'll find a lead pipe from the street to the house. And that's the homeowner's responsibility, by the way. It's not the city's responsibility. But for the most part, there's steel and you know, steel with copper lines going into the houses. But when if they're sampling at this standpipe instead of going into the house, how do they know what the lead levels are? Because it's not getting introduced into lead. They got to test inside the house, right? That's a problem. You know, you got to knock on somebody's door. I want to come in and test your water. They're going to think you're nuts, right? What do they do? I have a lead main coming into my house, believe it or not. You know, so always the shoemakers kids always have the worst shoes, you know that, right? So I have a lead main in my house that I've had for 20 years and uh, I haven't replaced it yet. But, and now I know it's there. So typically I drink only filtered water. I got a refrigerator. It's got those little things with the water coming out. It's got a lead filter on it. Um, and now we'll talk about that later on when we get it to lead. There's an outfit that actually certifies its filters and so on and so forth. So they know I have a lead main. Uh, they know they need to test houses for the EPA that ha may that have may have lead exposures. So uh, uh, they sent out a survey. You know what kind of piping do you have? How old is it? Is it copper? Is it soldered? And so on and so forth. You have a lead main. So I checked off. I have a lead main, and I have old yellow brass piping, and so on and so forth. So I was on the top of their list. So they made a deal with me. They send me twice a year. They send me a big bottle. I fill it that with instructions, either a, a, a first draw sample or a sample after running the water for a couple of minutes. I fill up the bottle, fill out a little bit of a form. I drop it into the, uh, you can't drop anything. Have you guys noticed you can't put anything in the mailbox anymore? In Queens, I don't know if that's in Manhattan. In Queens, they you can't put anything. They have a slot that's about the width of your finger to avoid fishing, you know, like people fishing things out of the mailbox. So you can't put packaging, you can't put anything thicker than an envelope in a mailbox anymore in Queens anyway, right? So you have to drop it off at the post office. But, you know, it's got prepaid. You drop it off at the post office, it goes to them, they analyze it, they send you back a report. Now, my, the highest I've ever gotten was 10 parts per billion, okay, uh, uh, of lead. So I know now what my level is. By the way, the EPA's drinking water standard for lead is uh, 15 parts per billion. Okay, so so I'm under the EPA standard, but still it's got some lead in it. Probably most likely from the lane, the, the main, maybe from some of that yellow brass piping, because it has a little lead in it too. They put it in brass piping to make it more machinable. So at any rate, so now I get uh, twice a year I get this analysis. I send this to them. In um, uh, in response, they take hundred dollars off my bill for doing this for them. Right, so it's kind of like a good deal for me and a good deal for them. So at any rate, so yeah, so, you know, they have a standard on that. The CDC, okay, the CDC has standards as well. For instance, there are approximately half a million children aged one to five with blood lead levels above five, five micrograms per deciliter. The reference level at which the CDC recommends public health actions be initiate, initiated, no safe blood lead level in children has been identified. Okay, certain kinds of toxins don't have a threshold, a threshold effect. Any exposure to it, uh, uh, has some health effects. They believe lead, which is a neurotoxin in children, has a health effect uh, at any level that you have exposure to, at least some uh, effect, right? But they've set a limit because they can't, they can't respond to every kid that has a tiny amount of lead uh, uh, in their blood. They can't have a, a, a massive response to every one of them. So they've set the limit, the action level, at uh, uh, five micrograms per deciliter. We're going to talk about what that level means in just a little bit. Okay, so who said that? CDC said that. 
who follows up? Who follows that up? The New York City Department of Health, the uh, 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 the Board of Education, so on and so forth. Uh, individual physicians test children for lead, they use that as a guideline. So we have any number of organizations that give us standards or methods that we can use to uh, uh, do measurements and, and understand what those measurements mean. Okay, concentration mass matters. So how much is something, how much of a toxin is present in the air, in the water, and so on and so forth, means something to us. That's something that we need to measure. Okay, typical, here's a typical OSHA permissible exposure limit. This is kind of a, a innocuous material, it's dust. And it's dust that's not otherwise regulated. In other words, it's not lead dust, it's not chromium dust, it's not welding fumes, it's just you know general dust. Like you would get in, a, in this room, the dust would probably contain some pollen, some mold spores, some fibers, cotton fibers, some, some wool fibers, some, uh, and a lot of dead skin, and you know, a whole bunch of stuff like that, right? That's considered nuisance dust, right? There is a standard for it because in some industries you, you, you create a lot of dust, right? And the standard right now is, is it, five, it used to be 15 milligrams per cubic meter. I think it's five milligrams per cubic meter right now. Okay, we're gonna talk about what does that mean, five milligrams per cubic meter? For starters, that's weight or mass to volume. What's a cubic meter of air? A cubic meter of air is a volume of air which is one meter by one meter by one meter square block of air that's one meter by one meter okay so we got a rough idea of what that is okay so the average worker breathes 10 cubic meters of air during an eight hour work day uh average person drinks about uh, breathes in about 20 during a 24 hour work day well, what does that mean that means that you're breathing in at that level you're breathing in 50 milligrams into your lungs of this dust this material that's gone. Some of it may get deposited in your lungs. Some of it may leave your lungs. And some of it may work its way out of your lungs through sputum, through, uh, sputum and whatever. Okay. Uh, or my over if you so 24 hour period, be 100 milligrams. But that's a quantity. That's a standard, and we understand. And we're not gonna we're not gonna always be measuring 10 cubic meters. In other words, exactly what a person is going to be breathing. But we might measure 50 liters of air to see how much dust is in that 50 liters. And we could figure out then that had we measured 10 cubic meters and it was the same amount, the same concentration, how much would have been in a cubic meter? So we can compare it to that standard. And we're gonna actually be doing this. We're gonna start next week actually, you know, taking some air samples and trying to measure uh, the amount of particulate matter that's present in the air and dust. So it's a pretty clean environment. Here, this room might be a little bit better because a little bit higher particular level because we have carpeting in here. The classrooms that uh, uh, don't have carpeting, they clean regularly and there's very little dust in those. We might be able to get some nice measurements in here. Okay, sometimes we're gonna be measuring very, very small concentrations, very minute amounts of chemicals. I just mentioned the uh, blood lead level for children, uh, action level is five micrograms per deciliter. Okay, remember before we were just talking about five milligrams. A milligram is a thousandth of a gram. A microgram is a, is a millionth of a gram, right? It's a thousandth of a milligram. So it's a millionth of a gram. So a microgram is a very tiny, tiny amount. And we have to, and we have to clinically measure that in a, ch a child's blood. Actually, a clinician would do that. But we might be charged with measuring how much of this material is in the dust that that child may uh, uh, wind up touching and licking and absorbing into their body. Okay, so what kind of measure? What level? What 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 is what is that measurement? So we sometimes get very small measurements, very tiny measurements. Sometimes we get in between measurements. Sometimes we get gross measurements. Asbestos containing material. The definition that the uh, the DBA has for asbestos containing material is that it contains more than 1% asbestos, right? How much asbestos, what's the threshold level for asbestos? Okay. 20. Huh? Threshold level, threshold, the threshold. Remember that idea of like, it shows health effects? Funny thing about carcinogens, carcinogens don't show a threshold effect. Remember what I was talking about? Remember what I was talking about alcohol? 
that you can drink one beer a night, two beers a night, four beers a night, five beers. It starts you at the threshold of it. Your body can deal with this exposure without showing health effects. But when you get to certain uh, too high an exposure, you start to see health effects. Most carcinogens don't show threshold effects. In other words, any exposure, the, more, the higher the exposure, the higher the risk. But there's no point at which that you can have an exposure and not have some risk. So it's like a straight, instead of going like this and like this, it's like a straight line, right? So carcinogens typically don't have uh, a, a threshold effect. So 1% is, uh, uh, yeah, material could have half a percent of asbestos in it, right? So if you have 100 pounds of this stuff, one pound of it is asbestos. That's an enormous amount of asbestos, right? So there's a little bit of a disconnect there between the, what you would consider the uh, regulations for airborne asbestos and what might be in a piece of material that you might define as asbestos. Now, lead containing paint, same deal. It used to be 1%, now it's down to 0.5%, half of a percent, right? But that's still a lot of lead. Remember that gallon container that we had, right? If it weighed, if it weighed uh, 10 pounds, 1% one, one, uh, one would have been a tenth of a pound, right? So a tenth of a pound, would be one percent, so a twentieth of a pound would be. And that's still quite a bit, a few ounces of actual lead in this thing. So a lot of times we're dealing with gross measurements of it. So how do you measure that? Well, you measure it by using instrumentation that tells you what percentage of lead is actually instrumentation we're going to be able to use that we have. We can just hold it up against the wall, and it will analyze the level of metals that are in the paint in the wall. Okay, we'll talk about that when we reach that point. Uh, you can also send the material to take a bulk sample of paint, send it to a lab, and they'll tell you how much lead is in there. The reason for these regulations are based on uh, how you are typically required legally to handle the material. So if you are, if you are uh, selling a house or something like that, you get an inspector to come in, he will highlight areas that over are over 1%, mm -hmm. but he won't highlight level areas that are under 1% because they're not considered half a percent because they're not considered lead contained. That doesn't mean that they're not dangerous. In fact, OSHA ignores this standard. OSHA says that if there is any measurable amount of lead in the paint, never mind 0.5%, then you have to protect the worker. That's likely to be disturbed. You have to protect the worker. Use the entire standard for lead to protect that worker. Okay, so OSHA completely ignores that. They say if there's any uh, 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 that the measuring devices that you use to measure lead have to be substantially more sensitive than that 0.5 percent level. They don't say how much more sensitive. They just say substantially more more sensitive. So you can't just measure to something that don't measure to the 0.5 percent. So you got to make a judgment. What instrument do I use? What, how do I do this analysis to satisfy OSHA? Do I need to satisfy OSHA and so on and so forth? Okay, let's talk about what things, uh, what these measurements are. For instance, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna ask you guys to write down for me. Yeah, I really should do this. How many of this? Thirteen. Okay. I want you to do this without looking at each other's results. Without looking ahead on this, in the PowerPoint. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> How many, would you guys read that very well? Uh, you didn't get to read, okay, I'm gonna do it anyway. If you, if you know the answer, don't answer now. There's a reason why I'm doing this. If you've seen the answer and you remember it, don't, how did that happen anyway? Did I hit that? I must have touched the, uh, Cursor. Okay, I mean, I got to get to that. You think? Okay, yeah, pass these back. I want you to write down for me in grams how much you think a nickel weighs. And if you have, if you don't have enough pieces of paper, write it on your own piece of paper, push it, and send it up here. How much do you think a nickel weighs in grams? Make it like I make it not whole grams, but maybe half grams, like like two grams or nine and a half grams or seven and a half grams or one gram, like half grams. Okay, your best guess. I want to demonstrate two things here. One thing I want to demonstrate is 
how well we know what a gra how much a gram is, number one. And number two, I want to demonstrate something called, I, I think it's called the wisdom of the crowd. How, how many guys, how many of you guys know, know, know of a stat, know, have heard of a statistician by the name of Galton? Galton, G-A-L-T-O-N. Galton did an experiment in the, I think, in the mid, in mid 19th century, did an experiment where he went to a fair and he, he, uh, 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 he found that they, that they were having a contest where farmers, if they guessed the weight of a sheep, that they, they would win a prize, maybe even win the sheep. I don't, I don't remember exactly what the deal was there. And none of them guessed the exact weight of the sheep. But accumulating all the individual results, and there were many, also this is important, that it be a very large sample as well. Many, many people guessed that the weight of the sheep, when he took the average of their guesses, it was almost exactly the weight of the sheep. And that's a principle called the wisdom of the of the crowd, and it works pretty generally pretty well if it's a, if it's a large crowd, and if it's uh, if they don't know what the other person's answer is. Okay, so push those numbers up front here. Okay, you hold on to it. You're going to add them up for me. Okay. You got the phone out, so. Okay, so give me give him your answer. Let's see what it is. Well, he's working on that. How many you got? So find the average, right? Yeah, find the average. All right. Okay, is that it? Got a couple more? Yeah, the more the better. Okay, you got a few more. Oh, those are blanks? Okay, those are. Okay, so I'm going to give you the answer while he's working on that. We'll see what it comes up with. But the answer is five grams. I can't read this. <laughs> <laughs> w. What? Leave that one off if you can't read it. Um, it's five grams. How many? How much do you think a penny weighs? Two and a half grams. Pennies two and a half grams. Okay. So anytime you need a weight, a standard for a weight, use a new nickel or a new penny, and supposedly it's exactly five and two and a half grams. The, the new pennies, new new uh, uh, nickels. Uh, that's the standard weight. You also have them if you want to use them as a guideline for diameters and so on and so forth. You have that as well. You know, so next time you need a need to measure something, take out a bunch of coins and you can kind of line them up and try and figure out what what the width, what the width, the, you can use the width, the yeah. diameter, the thickness, so on and so forth. How much? How much did you get? Two point six four. Two point six four. I guess we don't have a very wise crowd here. Some okay. Yeah, <laughs> you, you had a couple of people have yeah, they knew that's why they did that. Okay, so at any rate. But anyway, okay, so units matter here too as well. As, we, as we're as we going to learn, uh, a lot of times we're going to be in situations where we have to do a lot of conversions. Okay, pounds versus kilograms, ounces versus grams, gallons, liters, uh, a cubic feet versus cubic meters, and so on. So we're trapped in a, in a, um, uh, uh, a standard unit world, a standard unit country when the world, the world is metric, right? Uh, 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 not too many people are here. Uh, not, not many people here are old enough to remember uh, that Jimmy Carter uh, uh, was a proponent of switch, uh, switching us to the metric system. And for a long time, there were a lot, there was a lot of action that was going on in that conversion process. All, this, all the highway signs would change to miles per hour and kilometers per hour, right? So, so they were all converted over car. Uh, speedometers all had you know a dual scale in them and so on and so forth uh, a lot of uh, a lot of industrial practice was starting to switch over to the metric system and then um, yeah the administration changed and the new Republican administration didn't like the idea that it was too cumbersome and they said forget it we're going back to the uh, standard standard units right so that died out but there's a lot of advantages to using the metric system especially for the kind of measurements that we use that we do here the Mars Climate Orbiter was supposed to be uh, surveying. It was intended to orbit Mars in, in, uh, in different uh, uh, overlapping orbits uh, uh, in order to observe the climate in various parts of Mars at different times of, uh, different times of year. And unfortunately, 
it uh, I don't know if it skipped off into space or if it burned off burned up on reentry because it didn't go into orbit because engineers at NASA had uh, missed the conversion from English to metric units, and that was a hundred and twenty five million dollar uh, satellite that got burned up because there was a uh, uh, a series of engineers didn't notice that a conversion uh, uh, from metric to uh, standard units was not made correctly. I don't know. That's a good question. Most of the engineers are over there. <laughs> yeah, you would think, right? Uh, you know, who knows? I, who knows who messed who messed that up? But I'm sure it wasn't one person. I'm sure they do enough checks. Okay. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at at uh, a smaller measurements, tiny measurements. Remember, some of the stuff we do is gross, grams, pounds and so on and so forth. Some of the stuff that we do is going to be in very tiny, tiny quantities. So pass these down, okay? You can pass those down. Keep any that you don't use. Okay, uh, let me have one. Good, thank you. Okay, what we're going to do is, first of all, let's read what quantity of powder is inside this thing. Quantity. There's exactly one gram of powder inside this packet. I'm going to take that. I'm going to put it out on this table. So a nickel weighs five times that. Right? Nickel weighs five times that. Exactly right. Yep. Put five of them together. See if it's the same weight. Right? I don't care, Chin, sir. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, see, I don't know if you can see. Can you guys see this here? Right? So that's one gram. How many milligrams are there? 100. Uh, milligrams a thousand. thousand. There's a thousand milligrams there. How many micrograms are there? Ten. Micrograms. There's a millionth of a gram, right? So there's one, one gram. gram means there's a million, a million micrograms there. Okay. How much? How much uh, lead? How much blood does a five uh, five year old kid have in his body? Any nurses here? Any medical people? Somebody look it up on the internet. Ten grams. Uh, no volume. Volume, yeah, how much blood does a five-year-old? So, yeah, I got, I got computers to open there. Look it up on the internet. I don't see you guys typing. Type. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll take a guess if you don't type. Okay. What do you think? I would. My guess would be probably about two and a half liters. Yeah. Does that sound good to you guys? Okay. Let's call it two and a half liters. How many deciliters in two and a half liters? A deciliter is a tenth of a liter, right? So two and a half liters, 25 deciliters, right? 25 deciliters. How much lead is in a lead poisoned child's blood if it's five micrograms per deciliter? Five times 25, 125 micrograms. That's how much lead it takes to poison a child. At least I, I, you really shouldn't use the word poison. It's a very bad word poison. Because everybody's exposed to some lead. I mean, they just arbitrarily pick that level. It's an action level, really, more than anything else. So they're not poison, right? So 125 micrograms of lead is in that kid's blood. Since uh, since we got about 25 deciliters, that's five micrograms for every deciliter of blood in his body. We have a million micrograms there. If I take this, I hope that you guys doesn't look too familiar to you guys. And I and I take and I take half of that. How much do I have left there? I have five thousand micrograms, right? Five five hundred thousand micrograms. I have half of the million micrograms. That's half, right? Five hundred thousand. If I take half again, how much do I have now? Hundred twenty-five thousand. Um, excuse me. I have two hundred fifty thousand. If I take half again, you can do this if you want. I have, say, I don't know, 67,000, let's say 66,000. If I take half again, 33,000. If I take half again, I'm going to call it 16,000. Take half again, 8,000. Take half again, 4,000. Take half again, 2,000. Take half again, take half again, that's 1,000. Take half again. 500, right, 500, I don't know what that means, 500, half again, 250, and half again, 125 roughly, 
That's approximately how much lead it takes to, po uh, to poison a child. That little? That's it, right? That little, that little, little tiny little pile little right body. there. That's throughout his whole body, yes. Right, so that's what it takes. Now, granted, you know, just because, you know, if you got that much in his mouth, doesn't mean all of it gets metabolized once up in its blood. Some of it will pass through the system and so on and so forth. But that's how sensitive children are to lead exposure. So when lead comes up and children come up, you know, you got to say to yourself, well, gee, this is really something you got to be a little careful about. When I was a kid, they had lead in gasoline. They were burning lead in gasoline. They, uh, 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 Tetraethyl lead, it's a chemical they added to gasoline in order to improve its anti-knock uh, 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 capabilities. In other words, to raise the octane without making better gas. They would add, they would add, uh, uh, add lead. And the, and the exhaust pipes of those cars would come fumes, particulate with lead in it. It's all over the city, playgrounds, uh, on streets, and so on and so forth. So we had enormous lead exposures compared to kids today. So, and that's why, remember I mentioned that the, that, that the, that the uh, action level used to be like 25, and then it was 15, and then it was 10, and then it was 5. Well, the problem was they couldn't make it 5 for kids my age when I was a kid because then every kid would be above the action level, right? So as, as we got to the point where we could clean up the environment, react to this kind of stuff, we got to the point where we could reduce that. You remember, that's an arbitrary number. If they had set it at 10 instead of five, then they, instead of half a million kids at the action, above the action level, there might only be 20,000, right? But if they set it at two and a half instead of five, that might mean 20 million kids were above the action level. Now, these, so one of the things that they do when they set these arbitrary limits like that, in other words, when they tell you, oh, your blood sugar is under 100 or over 100, right? And if you're over 100, oh, well, you're diabetic. If you're under 100, you're not diabetic. Well, what they're doing is they're taking a the di normal distribution of a population, and they're saying to themselves, well, we really want to be uh, concerned about the people that are the highest part of this. But if we set it at if we set it at, at at 50, right? Well, then you know we're going to have too many people to that we're going to start doing treatment for, and be doing expensive treatment or follow up and diagnostics for. So we need to set it higher. But if we set it too high, then we miss people that could be benefit from treatment. So they arbitrarily pick a level. A lot of times that level is not a good level. They have to change it. They have to adjust that level for one reason, up or down for that reason. Okay, when we're done, clean up all the dust and stuff. So don't leave you with the chases out of the room. Yes. So <laughs> that action level is not 100% time based, but more like. Uh, so it's, so like it's at a, that level, it's, 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 it's not. Sorry, sorry. I mean, sorry, at that level, it's not. It doesn't mean that uh, if a child or soon that much, he starts showing symptoms, but because they do a way of. Uh, Typically, uh, at that level, they won't show symptoms. They would only detect that level in a blood test. And, and children going into New York City school, schools, they're supposed to come in with a certificate from their doctor that they got vaccinated, they got this vaccine, that vaccine, this vaccine, and they also got a, uh, they were screened for, for lead. So the, 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 typically it's the physician, their physician that, that, that actually does a blood test. And it's a moment in time. It's a, it's a blood lead level at the moment in time when he takes that test. He took it through a month later, it might be higher. A month, you know, a month early, it might be lower or whatever. So it's only at that moment in time that your body does absorb lead. Lead is a metal not too far on the periodic table of calcium, so your bones can uh, absorb lead also, right? So if you're exposed to it over a long period of time. So even if you stop being exposed to lead, you may find some lead in your blood as it leaches out of your bones from high exposures over a long period of time, right? But it's a quick, easy screening method so they can tell whether you're being exposed now, right? But it doesn't tell you if you've been exposed in the past or in the future and so on. But yeah, they do it at that age because, you know, that's an age when, you know, they have access to the kids. Kids got to get screened so you can go to school, right? So they know they can get the kid tested. Right, and and uh, it's also at a time, a point in their lives when they can still benefit from treatment. In other words, you want to screen him when he's 13 because you know it's a it's an issue with neurological development if he's already had that exposure for so long. It's a problem. Probably you start to show symptoms when they start to get up to 
15, 20, 30, 40. When you start to get up to 100, it, 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 it'll show some real health effects, and it's an emergency situation. They actually treat the child to remove lead from his body. That's called chelation therapy. There are chemicals called chelates. Uh, e, uh, there's one called, I can't never remember the whole formula, it's called EDTA, right, for instance. And this chemical, it's called a chelate. Chelate is a, the base of the word chelate is like from Greek for crab. And what it has, it has sites on the, on the, uh, uh, on the chemical, the molecule has sites on it where it has an affinity for metal ions. So what they do is they inject the child with the EDTA, and that in their blood will pick up uh, lead ions in their blood, and they'll be excreted with the with the uh, uh, chelating agent, right? And if the kid kid has a very high blood lead le blood lead level, like 50, 70, 100, right, and over 100 could be life threatening, right? They'll do chelation therapy. But for a kid who has a blood lead level of five or seven or ten, that's above the action level. They'll go and they'll try. Uh, they'll try and uh, reduce his exposure. That's how they won't give him chelation therapy. They won't uh, do any kind of uh, uh, medical intervention. They'll want to intervene in his environment, try and figure out where he's getting it from, and, and make sure he doesn't continue to be exposed. Because remember, a week later, you know, if he's not exposed to it, a week later it may be out of his blood. Okay. Okay. Good. So yeah. So that gives you an idea of the quantities that we're dealing with. Now the other thing was five milligrams, right? Five milligrams was, a, you know, a, a bit more than that, but that's a total amount of dust that's in a cubic meter of air that is above the OSHA permissible exposure. Okay, we could do the same thing, breaking this up in, until we got the five milligrams, five five thousandths of the amount of material that's in here. That's what well, it's five milligrams uh, is uh, not five thousand. Uh, uh, one two thousand of the amount of this material is the amount of dust in a cubic meter of air that would be right at the permissible exposure limit for nuisance dust. Yes? Something like asbestos, in which the fibers are very small. I'm glad you brought up asbestos. You will never really see it. That's a good point, right? With asbestos, gee, you know, that's a problem. Asbestos, you know, it's really something different. It's a fiber. Asbestos, we don't control by weight. The standard for asbestos is fibers per cubic centimeter, right? So the max that yeah the clear they, I I I'm not going to speculate about about uh, uh, exposure limits, but if they were to do asbestos work in here before they would reoccupy the space, there's a clearance level. In other words, it has to be less than a certain amount of, of fibers of asbestos fibers in the air before you can say people can go back and reoccupy it. I believe, if you guys do this best those work, I believe the clearance level is 0.1 fiber per cc, right? So what they're doing is they're counting fibers. So if you, if you sample cc as a thousandth of a liter, if you sample uh, a, a liter of air, there should be less than 100 fibers of asbestos in that air. In other words, less than a tenth of a fiber per cubic centimeter per milliliter of air in that, in that air. Okay, so... You know, I've been joining on here for a long time. Let's take a break. Quick break, five minutes, right? Take a breather. And, and I'm going to try and run through the rest of these. Okay, like I said, this is the only session where, where I intend to do just lecture. Well, actually, we played a little bit, right? You guys didn't, you didn't open up your packets there and play with those. But. Okay. All right, you can hang on to those for your coffee. I don't need a bag. Your tea. Um, that's a good question. I think it, uh, on the other floors is one, two, three for the female, and male is four, three, two, one. What is it? Oh, uh, yeah, on the eighth floor is one, two, three, four, or four, three, two, one. Give that a try. If it doesn't work, let me know. What, there's, there's people back there who'll be able to tell you. Okay. Oh, let me get this set up. Is that still working back there? Good. Okay.
Ah, thank you. Yeah, I don't want to leave this place a mess because it's a nice, it's a nice spot for us. I like those chairs. So that's yeah. Cool. It's also nice to have a big table like this where when we're working with the instruments to be able to spread out and do some, you know, and uh, do some work. That was a problem in the classroom because we only had that little table. And where is that? I took the lunchroom. There's no lunchroom there. Oh, no, I don't know. I don't, I don't spend any time down here. This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, guys. Okay, guys. Let's finish up. Let's uh, let's go through let's go through the rest of this. So we can be uh, we can kind of be uh, up to date for next week. Okay, guys. Let's go through. Let's go through this quickly. Now, okay. So we're going to do a lot of measurements. That the rest of the semester is going to be centered around measuring things in the environment. I mean, that's what the name of the course is, after all, right? So measurements going to take a lot of form. Could take the uh, form of uh, a weight, uh, a total weight with it, like when we measure solid, the percentage in the solid, it's a measurement that's a weight to weight. In other words, three ounces to 10 pounds, one gram to a kilogram of material, it's a percentage. Very frequently, we, we, we uh, describe that as parts per million. In other words, if we have a million pounds of sand and there's one pound of, uh, 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 red sand inside that million pounds of gray sand, that's one part per million of red sand in that material, right? It's a weight to weight measurement, right? So parts per million is unitless, right? It's pounds on top, pounds on the bottom, but it doesn't really have any units, right? It's just a, it's a proportion, right? So that's, you know, when we talk about 1% lead in, uh, in paint, that's uh, 1%. What, how, how many PPM is 1%? The total volume in there in millions is a million one percent of that would be well ten percent is a hundred thousand one percent is ten thousand so one percent of something in a solid is ten thousand parts per million one percent uh, a tenth of a percent is a thousand parts per million uh ten percent is a hundred thousand parts per million so it's a weight to weight ratio it's just literally just dividing one into the other and literally, for instance, 50-50, if you have, have some that's 50-50, you have uh, uh, 50 pounds of something out of 100 pounds total, it's 50 over 100, would be 50%. If I multiply the 50 on top by a million, right, it's 50 times a million over a million, so it's 50 parts per million. So you just set up your proportion, multiply by a million, it gives you your concentration in parts per million, when you're talking about solids. How about concentrations uh, in water? Well, water's kind of interesting because a lot of times you'll hear about parts per million of lead in water, parts per million of chlorine, parts per million of hardness in water, calcium in water, and so on. That's measured as milligrams per liter. Milligrams of this solid material like calcium dissolved in a liter of water right? Milligrams per liter is the same thing as parts per million. Well, how is that? How is that possible? 
a, a, a liter of water contains how many cubic centimeters, also called milliliters of water? A thousand, right? How much does each one of those cubic centimeters or milliliters weigh? Cubic centimeter of water weighs one gram. That's part of the metric system. They set it up that way. So a liter weighs a thousand grams. A liter is a kilogram of water, right? So uh, if you talk about parts per million, right? Well, then uh, you have a liter represents a thousand cc's, right? Thousand grams of water. And now, if you talk about if you talk about um, uh, 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 a thousandth of a gram, a milligram, right? A milligram is a thousandth of a gram, and a gram is a thousandth of a kilogram, which is the same thing as a liter of water. So a thousandth of a thousandth is a millionth. So when you say milligrams per liter of water, it's the same thing as saying parts per million, because of that interchange between grams and cc's one that's why the specific gravity of water is one because one gram per cc uh if you have if you have heating oil heating oil uh, heating oil uh, floats on water it's it's lighter than water it might be a, uh, a density of 0.9 instead of one because it's lighter than that water is right one cc of it weighs less than a gram okay we don't have to worry about that right now we'll work on that later on okay so there's a lot of ways that, that so parts per million, and when we're talking about solids, when we're talking about things dissolved in water, we're ta typically using the term parts per million. Okay, when we're talking about, okay, come on, I'm stuck here. Oh, here we go. There we go. We're talking about concentrations in air. A lot of the time we're talking about milligrams when it's particulates like dust uh, uh, and so on. We're talking about milligrams per cubic meter of air. So we have mass or weight, right, divided by volume. And that's a standard measure that we're going to be doing it. We're not always going to be measuring the amount of dust that's in a cubic meter of air because it's going to take a long time to sample a cubic meter of air very frequently sampling a smaller volume, but we're then gonna convert it into that same ratio. How, well, if this much was in 100 liters of air, how much is in, would, would have been in a cubic meter of air? Again, metric system makes this very simple because how many liters are there in a cubic meter of air? Anybody want to hazard a guess? What do you think would be really convenient? Wouldn't it be really convenient if there were a thousand liters in a cubic meter of air? Make all the calculations really simple. That's exactly what there is. Think about it. Uh, if you think about it, one side is a meter, right? One side is a meter. Each meter, uh, 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 each meter, a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter, right? So each meter, each side has ten. Uh, uh, has excuse me, each each meter has 100 centimeters. So there are 10 centimeters 10 times in a single, in a meter, right? So 10 centimeters, right? And, and you have 10 of these. So cubic, cubic uh, a, a liter is 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters. 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000 centimeters, right? So a box, which is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, is one liter. Right, thousand centimeters or thousand liters, milliliters, same thing. That's a liter. If you look at that, well, you have ten of those this way, ten of those boxes this way, ten of those boxes this way, ten of those boxes this way. So you have ten times ten times ten, a thousand of those one liter boxes in every cubic meter of air. So look how convenient that is, right? So that's why the metric system is much much nicer for doing doing calculations. Okay, what about? Okay, that's fine. Concentration of particulates in air are going to be usually going to be in the form of weight per cubic vo per volume, very often cubic meter. What about concentration of asbestos in air? Well, we're just talking about asbestos. We're not really concerned about the weight of asbestos. We're concerned about those fibers. So we actually use a technique where we capture the fibers in the air, in the volume of air, and we actually count those. We're going to be working on that. 
ourselves, or actually maybe doing some of that work, I hope. Okay. So fibers per cc of air. Okay, we want very, you know, we're not, we're not gonna use, a, 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 a lot of times we use a, a, a particulate per cubic meter when we're, when we're looking at large quantities. When we're looking at smaller quantities, if we use liter, a cubic meter, fibers per cubic meter, it's gonna be a gigantic number. So uh, at the levels that we're gonna be working at. So instead we look at it, how many fibers per, per uh, cubic centimeter, per thousandth of a liter, which is also a millionth of a cubic, of a cubic meter. Okay, again, it's the metric system makes it a little bit simpler. Okay, so concentration of, of gases in air, that gets a little bit more complicated. Interestingly enough, when we're working with VOCs, volatile organic compounds, things that evaporate into the air, in that situation, we're not dealing with weights anymore. Our concentrations usually are going to be measured either uh, in, uh, from a laboratory, they're going to be measured in usually in milligrams of that material per cubic meter of air, just like particulates are, weight per cubic meter per volume. But most of the standards that we're going to compare it to are going to be in parts per million. Right, so we need to think about it as far, even though we might work with it in milligrams per cubic meter, we need to work with it in terms of parts per million. So it's parts per million with when we talk about gases is going to be the volume of the contaminant compared to the volume of air that it's residing in. Okay, so volume to volume. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this for a second. I'm gonna do something here. Notice I, I, I put benzene down here, and I said the molecular weight was 78. The time weighted, at the, the OSHA permissible exposure limit for benzene is 1 ppm. Short-term exposure limit is 5 parts per million. Again, lab reports usually give you milligrams per cubic meter. Uh, we can't really use that here. We need to convert that into parts per million. When we deal with gases, it's no longer weight to weight. It's now volume to volume for parts per million. So we got to figure out. One ppm. How many? How many? Uh, uh, are we above that level or below that level when we're measuring benzene in the air? Molecular weight of benzene is 78. How do I get that? Benzene is a is a uh, cyclical compound. Six, it's got six carbons in a ring. It's got H's on each one of them. So there's six carbons times 12 each. Uh, uh, and then we add in the the hydrogen, so it comes out to 78. That's the molecular weight is 78. So, so how am I gonna how am I gonna figure out what kind of volume that I'm working with? I'm gonna open this up here, so we can't do a quick calculation here. Okay, so I'm gonna just pick out a number here. Let's say that a lab sends a lab, you send a sample to a lab. You you sample a uh, uh, you sample uh, 50 liters of air. Okay. You sample. I'm going to. I'm going to call that. I'm going to make a little. Seat. You sample 100 liters of air. Sample 100 liters of air. The lab tells you that gee, uh, 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 that that 100 liters of air that you sample, it had, it had. Um, 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 I'm going to make up a number now. Uh, it had 10 milligrams of benzene in it. Okay, so 10 milligrams of benzene in that liter of air. Okay, so, so how much how much benzene would have been in a thousand liters, or in other words, a meter cube? Okay. Would have been 100 milligrams. Would have been in a uh, 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 in a thousand if you had sampled a thousand liters instead of 100, right? So there's a uh, hundred milligrams per cubic meter. Of air. Okay, so a cubic meter of air, right? Right. How much is that? That's a thousand liters. Is a cubic meter of air. But we got a hundred milligrams of benzene. What volume does a hundred milligrams of benzene take up? I know the molecular weight of benzene is seventy-eight. Does that give me any information about the volume that uh, ben that that much benzene would take up? You guys remember something called Avogadro's number? Yeah, I'm going to just say six because that's too complicated for me. Times 10 to the 23rd. That's the number of molecules that are in a mole of 
any compound, any gas at all, right? That's a, but we also know that one mole, which is a molecular weight in grams, right? In other words, there's six times 10 to the 23rd in the molecular weight in the mole or molecular weight in grams. In other words, in 78 grams of benzene, there's that many molecules of benzene. And how much volume does it take up at standard room, at standard temperature and pressure? 20, what was that? 22.4 liters. So if we have 78 grams of benzene, right, we have 22.4 liters of benzene, right? So let me think about this for a second. We don't have 78 grams of benzene. We only have 100 milligrams, which is a tenth of a gram, 0.1 gram. So we have 0.1 gram, right, of benzene out of 78 grams of benzene. So what proportion is that? What is 0.1 divided by 78? Anybody come up with that for me? 0.1 gram, 78, right? Anybody got that calculator? Okay. 0 0.001, close enough? You guys happy with that, close enough? Okay, so we have 1,000 of the amount of benzene that would give me 22.4 liters. So times 22.4, how much actual volume of benzene do I have? Right, I'm gonna move this over one, two, three places. So I have 0 0.022 liters of benzene. Now, if I go back here, in a thousand liters, right? That was what, what I expect to have in a thousand, in a thousand, in a thousand liters. So I have 0 0.022 liters out of a thousand liters, right? What is that in parts per million? Is equal to X over a million. Right, so what that's what is that going to be? That's going to be let's see, a thousand x is equal to a million times that, which is going to be twenty two zero 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 divided by a thousand. So that cancels out. So we have twenty two parts per million of benzene that's in the air. That's our conversion from milligrams per cubic meter to parts per million. I might have got that, yeah, if I got it wrong here. You get the idea of what we're doing here. We're, we're converting a mass of benzene to the volume equivalent and then comparing it to the amount of air that we've actually sampled. Yes? Okay, I'm gonna do this again. I'm recording this, by the way. So I'll post this later on. If you wanna go over any part of the stuff that we discussed tonight, you can always go over it. This is, you know, with this stuff, this kind of general stuff, I don't think it'd be that valuable. But when we're talking about, you know, setting the lab up, doing calculations, the fact that I'm recording it may be handy for you to be able to look at later on. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna kill the rest of the time that we have on this, but the idea is, is that uh, if you know what the weight, if I sample, if I sample a, a cubic, let's say I sample the whole cubic meter of air, a thousand liters of air, I'm, is that still something back behind there? I, I sample a thousand liters of air, right? And there, there is a, a hundred milligrams of benzene in that cubic meter of air that I sample, right? I now know that there's a hundred milligrams per cubic meter of air, but that hundred milligrams doesn't help me. I need to know the volume of benzene that's in a thousand liters of air. And the way I can figure out what the volume is, is that that hundred milligrams is, is only a, a hundredth of approximately of the amount that would give me 22.4 liters, right? So I can figure out what proportion of that 22.4 liters that that 100 milligrams represents. Uh, no, uh, that's, that's part of Avogadro's number. That's part of, in other words, just like Avogadro's number tells us that one mole of any, pro, any material gives us that many molecules. We also know a standard temperature and pressure 
one mole of a gas takes up 22.4 liters. That's one mole and one mole of oxygen. Oxygen. O yes, that's a constant. One mole of oxygen is uh, is O2 is 32. 16 times two is 32. 32. 32 grams of oxygen takes up 22.4 liters. Nitrogen is 17. N2 is 34. 34 grams of nitrogen takes up 22.4 liters, right? So if you know what mass, how much you have, in other words, how many grams, if you, uh, so for instance, oxygen, if I told you that you had, um, uh, uh, what did I just mention, oxygen, 32 grams gives you 22.4 liters. Mm -hmm. How much does 16 grams give you? Half of that. Half of that, bingo, that's exactly right. So if you know how much you have in grams at standard temperature, and you know the molecular weight at standard temperature and pressure, you know the volume, okay? And that's how I figured that out. I said, okay, this is how much I measured, and I went backwards through that. I, I backed through the whole thing. We're going to do this again because we're going to actually going to be testing. We're going to be taking samples for organic vapors, and we're going to wind up doing this calculation again. Okay, do you guys get the general impression of what went on there? Right, we're taking advantage of things we understand about the, the behavior and measurement of gases or VOCs. Sure. You can actually go online. You can find a formula or calculators online. We'll do the same thing for you. You have to put in the same information. You have to put in the number of liters of air that you sample. You have to put in the molecular weight. And you have to put in the amount of the uh, the weight of the material that you're that you want to find the parts per million for. So it's literally the same three inputs that we have would go into that formula. It would do the conversion for you automatically. In fact, there's apps on your phone you can download to do this conversion. Okay, but if you if you kind of do it like if you kind of try and work through where that's coming from, it'll help you understand what's actually going on there. Okay, I mean, you can always just use the calculator and plug it in and get the right answer. But yeah, I encourage you to give this a try. Then use the calculator and make sure you're right. Okay, okay. okay so how do we measure microbiologicals, right? Well, usually it's, it's colony forming units. So usually we're, we're, trying, we're growing them. We, we're interested in whether or not they're viable or not. So what we're doing is we're mixing them into a growth medium and we're actually counting how many colonies are formed. So it might be colony forming units per cc of air that we sampled, for instance, or colony forming units per liter. They lead, uh, when we talk about um, uh, co uh, uh, E. coli, coliform, coliform is bacteria associated with human or animal waste, right? And when you test drinking water, your, your kind of standard microbiology test for drinking waters is coliform, total and E. coli. E. coli is usually associated with uh, human fecal matter. Okay, why are we interested in those kinds of bacteria? Are, are the kinds of E. coli that you're testing for necessarily dangerous bacteria? There are forms of E. coli that are very dangerous, right? The form that you're testing for probably is not dangerous. You test for it anyway. Why do you why do you use that kind of as a clearance method for water? Well, if you're getting human or animal waste, if the E. coli, if E. coli or total coliform are present in the water, it means that you have animal or human waste in the water, right? And it means that there's a possibility you could have other, you got other bacteria in the water that are pathogens, right? So at least if you know there's no coliform in there, you know that it's not contaminated with animal or human waste. So there's a high probability that the water is safe to drink. So coliform test is done as a screening method for water. If you're not really interested in the coliform, you're interested in the fact that if it's there, there could be other bad factors in there that are worse, right? So a lot of times you'll see that. And that'll, that'll usually be, uh, 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 I think it's usually colony forming units per cc. And if there's any present, you know, then that's a problem. Um, uh, mold spore counts. A lot of times when you, when you do mold testing, uh, the mold is in a wall, is in the air conditioning system and so on and so forth. It's not really accessible. You can test, you can do bulk testing. But if you're interested in how much is present, of how many, how much of present material from mold is present in the air, such as spores? Well, you can actually sample the air, capture the spores on, onto a, a collection device, and actually count how many there are. 
it, there's no standard for this, but you could certainly, for instance, if you are concerned about this area being mold affected, well, you might test here and do a mold spore count. You might test in another room, you might test outdoors and compare the levels to see if you see unusual amount of mold spore activity in this area that you're concerned about. And how would those count? Those are usually spore, spores per cubic meter. You don't really sample a cubic meter. You sample 15, uh, 15, uh, 150 liters, let's say. And then the lab will convert, you know, uh, if there were 100 spores in the 150 liter, 150 liters, then there must have been 600 spores in, uh, uh, in um, uh, a cubic meter. So they'll change it over to a standard. So if you measured 150 liters here and 75 next door, you'll be able to compare the two of them. If you don't adjust them to get a get the same volume, uh, uh, the rate of the same volume, then you really can't compare the two of them. Okay, environmental sampling, industrial hygiene. Okay, we do grab samples, we do integrated samples. Uh, uh, we sample. Sometimes we're sampling for analysis right on site. We're using direct reading instruments. A lot of times we're sampling for the laboratory. Uh, the sample goes to the laboratory. The laboratory does the analysis of what was in the air. And, uh, and we get feedback from the laboratory and have to do some reporting based on that. Uh, Real-time sampling, in other words, we can do monitor continuously. Indoor air quality is devices that you can monitor CO2 levels, which give you a, a, a relative level of ventilation rates uh, exchanged with outside air in a uh, occupied space. We take continuous readings there. Particulate levels, we can take, particulate, we can take uh, continuous readings on uh, instruments that measure and record the levels of particulates and then we can see that at a certain time of the day particulate levels are higher or lower and we can respond to that bulk samples might be if we see mold on a wall we're not really sure it's mold we can actually take a sample of that material we can take a sample of the paint and send it to a lab to determine whether there's lead in that typical kind of bulk sample wipe samples we just talked about wipe samples for instance in lead uh, rather than testing the air for lead um, uh, we actually test the dust, the settled dust on surfaces. Instead, if there's lead in the dust in the air, it's going to settle out, so you would expect to find it in the dust. Anybody know anything else that we usually test for uh, using wipes? In schools, you might do some testing for it in schools, and uh, if you had a transformer fire, you might test for PCB. it. PCBs, right. PCBs are oils. Right. If you have a if you have a fire, you get particulates going up with the smoke and so on and so forth. Smoke goes everywhere. Uh, the particulates settle out onto surfaces. So if you went into a space, uh, you wouldn't measure PCBs in the air, but you might find it on surfaces after those droplets, those oily droplets, had you know dropped out onto surfaces. So you usually test for PCBs using wipes or bulk, bulk samples also. Okay, breathing zone versus area samples. Any OSHA regulations that you're gonna deal with almost always refer to permissible exposure limits in the breathing zone of the worker. And typically over an average work, eight hour workplace exposure, that's average, okay? And, but on a lot of indoor air quality work, you're not chasing people around putting instruments in their, uh, uh, in their faces, right? So in, in those situations, indoor air quality, very frequently you're doing area monitoring rather than personal or breathing zone monitoring. Sampling pumps. You got to need a way to, to, grab, to grab air and capture it and figure out what's in it. So we typically use air sampling pumps. And there's a whole series of them from almost dead silent little battery pack pumps that you can put on your waist and a worker can wear, wear for a whole eight-hour expo eight exposure. The high flow pumps that we use for area monitoring so we can suck a lot of air and get very fine measurements of, say, for instance, for asbestos and so on and so forth when we do area monitoring. So you, have, you can have uh, 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 low flow pumps that uh, you know, sample at less than one, one liter per minute or all the way up to these high flow pumps that can uh, draw hundreds of liters per minute. Usually we're, you're in the range of that one to three pump that, uh, and, the, and the five to 20 pump. Uh, different kinds of devices to collect these samples and gravimetric, count, uh, so on and so forth. There's a whole series of different kinds of devices we used to make to capture things that might be in the air. Okay, so for instance, if you look at these back here, 
there's a whole series of cassettes or devices that get connected to a pump that are used to collect samples. Some of these are used to collect asbestos samples. Those ones in the bottom right hand corner are used for asbestos samples. The ones on the top left hand corner or bottom right hand corner uh, look like mold spore devices that are intended to capture mold spores. The ones up in the upper right, I guess, are for other kinds of particulate, right? So, uh, and the thing in the middle has a special purpose. We're going to learn about that next week. Sorbent tubes. Remember we mentioned benzene, right? One of the problems is, is that benzene, the, the uh, 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 permissible exposure limit for benzene is one part per million. Why is it so low? Was there, it's a carcinogen, right? It's like no human carcinogen. Do we have any exposure? Do anybody here have exposure to benzene? Anybody here gas up their own car? Yeah. Here you go. Right. There's benzene and gasoline, trace amounts of benzene and the gasoline. So uh, unless you use the New Jersey Turnpike where you're not allowed to gas up your own car, you're getting an exposure to benzene every time you use the uh, you gas up your car. Smoke's <laughs> What's that? You smoke. Yeah, if you smoke also, right? There's benzene and cigarette smoke as well. Good. Yeah, that's a good point. Right. So yeah. So let's say we we we're, we're in a work environment and we and we suspect or know that there's benzene in the air. How do we measure that? Well, we got to collect a sample for a laboratory to analyze that. Well, there's a couple of ways that we could do that. One way is we need to get that benzene to the lab, right? And, uh, to, in the form that the lab can figure this out. So one of the ways you use a pump with one of these saw. Oh wait, Jesus, 750 already. Use one of these. I'm gonna go very quickly here. Use one, you, that's okay. If you have to catch a train or something like that, don't worry about it. It's like recorded. I won't say anything important anyway. Right. <laughs> so, so we'll really get into this stuff next week. So, so uh, these sorbent tubes, some of them have activated charcoal in them. You hook them up to a pump, you suck air, say 100 liters of air through that tube. The activated charcoal captures the benzene. You send that to a lab. The lab analyzes that activated charcoal using a GC. They measure the amount of activated charcoal, let you know that there were 20 milligrams of benzene in, in that activated charcoal. Now you know the 100 liters of air that you sampled had that quantity of benzene. That's one technique that we use. We also use techniques that involve all these other kinds of equipment, which I'm really blown through here very quickly. As we go on, when we get to the point where we, where we actually have a report that you have to do, the week before that, I will go over with you the uh, uh, the uh, methodology in here, but it'll go over with you the methodology for uh, um, uh, what sections your report should have, uh, how you should format it. Um, uh, you might and, and uh, the uh, the, the uh, grading for the report, how we'll be grading the report, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of other stuff in this PowerPoint. You can go go through it, but everything that's in here, we're going to be covering in more detail as the semester progresses. So you can look at this, but you can also count on the fact that whatever's in here and whatever I discussed tonight is going to come up again, but in greater detail and uh, individually. Okay, so good night, guys. Sorry I went a little long.